Yeah. Um, these slides are not owned by me, so I can't give them to you. But they're in the videos, so feel free. That's actually when I was in med school, I used to uh, video record, uh, well, video and audio record. And then I would go back and listen to the recordings and watch the recordings and take my notes that way. It actually worked best for me, but it was like double dipping, so it took up some time. So, but I did my best studying at two, three in the morning. So, yeah, trust me. Some people can do it, but it wasn't, it wasn't fun. Okay, so let's talk about blood. Okay, so first thing first, it is one of our connective tissues. All right, it is the third classification, the fluid connective tissue. And just think of your blood, all right, it's going to be like the pipes in your house, your circulatory system or like the pipes in your house, water, sewage, whatever is flowing through. And that's pretty much what we have going with our blood, all right? Our blood is the transport system throughout our body, all right, for nutrients, all right, that includes respiratory gases, oxygen, okay? Uh, and then it will actually carry wastes, all right, cellular waste, carbon dioxide is a cellular waste, ammonia, and then a bunch of other stuff, which we're gonna kind of go through, all right, our solutes. So, and we just got done talking about chapter 17, the endocrine system, so the hormones. Right? Our circulatory system, our blood, is going to be the delivery mechanism for all right, those chemical messengers, those hormones. All right? we, got, we were fortunate last semester, or whenever you took 210, to learn about all right, one of our control center mechanisms, the nervous system. Okay? Well, another control center mechanism in our uh, homeostasis model is going to be our uh, blood, I mean, excuse me, the endocrine system, which we just finished. So now we get to talk about how we move those hormones throughout the body. So this right here is basically everything in this uh, uh, chapter right there in four bullet points, okay? We call the bloodstream the, the cardiovascular system, all right? Cardio, discussing the heart. Vascular, the blood vessels, all right? So the heart pumps the blood. The blood moves throughout the body, okay? Any blood vessel that leads away from the heart, that carries blood away from the heart, is going to be an artery. Artery away. Okay? Veins are going to bring blood toward the heart. Okay? Now you're going to find, right, <clears throat> that some blood vessels are going to carry what we call oxygenated blood, and some will carry deoxygenated blood. Okay? So a lot of people will confuse that with, oh, arteries carries oxygenated blood. No, not always. I'm going to see that here this semester. Okay? Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Okay? Veins bring it towards. And then we have our capillaries, which are amazing structures because they're going to allow that exchange of nutrients and wastes and gases, hormones, yada, yada. All right, they're going to allow the exchange of those uh, items from the blood to the tissue and from the tissue to the blood. Okay? Off the top of your head, does anyone recall what type of tissue lines the epithelium? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it is, okay. All right, we know it's epithelium, okay? And specifically, it's termed endothelium when we're talking about the lining of a lymphatic or blood vessel. But does anyone remember the specific type of epithelium that is going to line the capillary? Think about it. It's going to be very thin. It's great for filtration, absorption, secretion. Remember what type of uh, epithelium does that? Well, let me ask you this. Would it be simple or stratified? Simple. Bam. Okay. So you want it to be thin. Of all those cell types, what's the thinnest? The squamous, yep. So the simple squamous. Simple squamous epithelium is going to, in fact, capillaries are one single cell layer thick. That's ideal. You, know, you don't want oxygen to have to push its way through 50 cell layers. So it doesn't make sense. All right? If it only has to push its way through one cell layer, awesome. We're going to maximize our, our transport, our, our, our filtration. It's good stuff. All right. So that's what we see with capillaries, all right? So let's talk about what makes up the blood. And there's two major things, or two components. You've got your formed blood elements. That's all the stuff, okay? 
all the blood cells, all right? And you're gonna see where we're, we're gonna learn about where these cells come from originally, all right? So our formed elements are gonna be like our, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets for clotting, okay? So that's gonna be all the stuff. And then we got the, the, the plasma, which is the liquid portion of it, all right? Or the fluid portion. And that's gonna contain everything else. So what we call the, the plasma proteins, which we'll talk about, all right? And our dissolved solutes, which could be almost anything. Hormones, ions, electrolytes, all that stuff, okay? So let's keep it simple in the beginning here, all right? KISS, keep it simple, all right? Formed elements and the plasma are gonna be the two components that make up your blood, okay? So if you cut your finger, all right, and blood starts pouring out, all this stuff is gonna be pouring out of you, all right? So for our formed elements, those are gonna be the cells that we're gonna talk about. Our red blood cells are the erythrocytes, okay, RBCs. Leukocytes, the white blood cells, and then our platelets. Platelets are the smallest, all right? And then like the fluid medium, if you remember when we were talking about connective tissue, connective tissue is made up of cells and then what we call the extracellular matrix. And that's just all the stuff that's outside the cells. So the extracellular matrix is made up of ground substance and protein fibers. Our ground substance for blood is the plasma, okay? You heard it from me. If you ever see it on a test, you'll definitely know. Okay, so the ground substance for our blood is the plasma. Okay, and everything else sits in that. All right, so when we talk about our, our, our bloodstream, hold on one second, I have a bad simple squamous. That's right, Hannah. I'm going to keep the conversation up on the screen because I'll miss it. Um, <clears throat> oh, so the reason why I was telling you. I, with my teaching, all right, I like to walk around the classroom, but I can't, so I'm stuck here in the corner. I'm like, baby, I got put in the corner, all right? Does anyone know where that's from? Nobody puts a baby in the corner? Yeah, well, the actor said that they hated saying that line. That's right, Casey, dirty dancing. Yes, nobody puts baby in the corner. Good call. All right, so let's talk about, all right, the function of the blood. Why does it do what it does? First one, transportation. I mentioned that, okay? So it's going to move those formed elements throughout our body, okay? Not only that, check it out. We got dissolved molecules and ions. Well, that's great. So when you guys go and get your blood drawn, have you ever read your blood report? You know, I mean, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but your doctor definitely should be or your nurse or whoever, all right? It has a list of all this stuff on there. All right, sodium, potassium levels, calcium levels. That's what they're looking at. All of that is in the blood plasma, okay? So they're gonna be looking for that, your oxygen levels too, all right? So you've probably done pulse ox before, all right? Does anyone know the value, the minimum value that your blood oxygen levels should be at? What percent saturation? 96, 96%, that's a lot. All right, I actually did an experiment last semester when I was walking from my car up to the third floor here with a pulse oximeter on my finger with my mask on and everything. So I wanted to see if it dropped my, my, um, my, saturate, my O2 saturation levels. And it only did it by 1%. I think it went from like 97 to 96. Maybe I need to walk farther, but I'm going to, you know, but that was a little experiment. And so, because you hear some folks saying that it drops your oxygen levels by rebreathing in the air from your mask. And it, it's quite possible, but it didn't drop mine enough. All right, so consider, all right, the first function for blood is transportation. We're gonna move stuff around, all right? In fact, that's how we get oxygen to our tissues, all right, via the red blood cell, the hemoglobin molecule, okay? But also we see, this one always made me interested, heat. Like, what the heck, heat? Well, think about it, all right? When you're outside working out, raking the yard in the summertime, all right, you get flush, you get red, all right? You increase the blood flow to your cutaneous or skin blood vessels. Your blood is generally one degree warmer than your normal body temperature. Did any of you guys know that? I never knew that, all right? I mean, I, I knew it because I was teaching class, but I mean, um, I never knew that before. But when you start to get overheated or you start to sweat, all right, you vasodilate all the blood vessels in your skin, all right? And that brings the, the blood to the, closer to the surface of your skin and then the heat that blood carries can be given off so you can cool down, okay? All right, protection is the next one. 
All right, because it carries the white blood cells are leukocytes, all right, and they're involved in the immune function for our body, all right, it protects our body from infection. Hopefully it should, all right. The plasma proteins, all right, they are going to actually protect the blood because when we go through the plasma proteins, we're going to talk about antibodies. We hear a lot about antibodies now, don't we? And immunoglobulins, all right, those are antibodies. They are also going to protect all right, the body against pathogens. All right, platelets obviously are going to protect us from blood loss. All right, allows us to clot the blood. And also, when we talk about fibrinogen, that's another plasma protein. That is a, a plasma protein that helps to make a scab, essentially. All right, so it helps to prevent all right, the loss of blood when you've damaged a blood vessel. Okay, so that's what we're referring to right, when we talk about uh, protection. All right. I talked about the body temperature, okay? Helps with regulation for several of our body functions, okay? So as your cells are undergoing metabolism for whatever process that they might be undergoing, if it's a perfect example of skeletal muscle cell, all right? When it's undergoing its contractile phase there, it's gonna generate heat, all right? Pretty much almost every chemical reaction that you've learned about, the breaking down of ATP into ADP is going to give off some heat. That's just what happens when you break that phosphate bond. It's a high energy bond. So it provides heat, all right? And so your body will start to collect and the tissues will start to absorb the heat. Well, the blood goes to those tissues, all right? And it will start to help by taking some of the heat away, all right? And then the blood will transfer itself towards the skin, all right? And it gets released in those cutaneous blood vessels. Here's something back, and you're going to find this out. And for those of you that have had me before, awesome. For those of you who've never had me, I hope it doesn't become annoying, but I will draw upon a lot of the things that you learned in 210. It's important that you know that. It's a foundation for you, so we need to maintain that foundation. Um, and me just saying that, I forgot what I was going to say now about 210. Ah, I'm mad about that. It'll come to me. Darn it. Um, body uh, pH. We'll learn a little bit more about this, but in Chapter 2, you learned about buffering and neutralization. And it's important because your blood has what we call buffers, and they prevent, all right, the pH, remember acids and bases and all that? Your normal average value for the pH of your blood, and you should know this, is 7.4. That's close to neutral. It's a little bit more on the base side, but it's close to neutral. 7 is neutral. Okay, 7.4 for your pH of your body. But the scale that we use is 7.35 to 7.45, so 7.4 is right in the middle. So your body's always trying to maintain that value, okay? And so to keep it in that range, it has these blood buffers that we'll talk about, all right? We'll learn about that when we do, um, I can't remember. Anyways, in which chapter, but I think it might be later on in this chapter, now that I think about it, all right? So those are those chemical buffers. There was a reason why you had to learn that back in chapter two, all right? So now you'll have that opportunity when we talk about the buffering. All right, and then our fluid balance, okay? It's really important that you understand, all right, when we talk about our fluid balance, you need to maintain a certain blood volume, all right? On average, it's about five liters. For, for, for men, it's a little bit more than women, all right? But it's five liters, okay? So a lot of that fluid balance, all right, or that fluid, that intake comes from the water that you get from drinking and, some, and from some of the food that you, that you eat, okay? So that water eventually will make its way from the GI tract into your blood or into cells, okay? So you're constantly losing water. Obviously, you lose the most water when you go to the bathroom, when you pee. You lose some through your feces, you lose some as you're exhaling through, as water vapor, all right? And then you lose some through your skin, just naturally through your skin, not through perspiration, it's called transpiration. And every once in a while, the sweat glands in your skin just a little, a little puff of, of uh, water vapor, okay, it's just what they do, all right, and so you'll lose some, all right, through the skin, but mainly through peeing and breathing, okay, well anyways, we need to maintain a certain amount of fluid in your body, all right, for metabolic processes, for your blood pressure, what's one of the things that they do if you start to bleed out, all right, if you start to hemorrhage blood, all right, what is one of the things that they do in the hospital, obviously they're going to give you blood, all right, but say you're in the back of uh, an ambulance, all right, and they don't know your blood type. What do they give you? 
They give you fluids, that's right. Yeah, a saline. Saline, they give you physiologic saline, okay? Which is 0.9 uh, sodium chloride, okay? 0.9%, I should say. And what they do is they, they do that to maintain your blood volume. Because what happens if your blood pressure drops down because your, your blood volume is going down? Does anyone know what happens at home when your blood volume just starts to go down? Obviously, you could die. I know that. But what will happen before that? Yeah, the blood pressure drops. You're going to shock. All right, you're going to shock. So in order to prevent that, that's right, Casey, you're going to shock. So pre to prevent that, they'll give you all right, fluids, okay? So anyways, my whole point is you're going to see that fluid exchange occurring between the blood and the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid outside the tissues, in between the cells and the tissues, there, okay? And we're going to talk big time about this term here, osmotic. Does anyone remember what osmotic or osmosis is? That's how I learned a lot of this material, by the way. I put my textbook under my pillow and I let that information travel into my brain through osmosis. Except osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane, okay? So if you're taking a test, and in the test question, they talk about uh, a situation, that's right, the movement of water. Um, if they talk about a situation, uh, what kind of process all right, passive process, and they never mention water in the question, it cannot be osmosis. You have to have water movement, all right? Okay, it's going to go from an area of high concentration of water to low concentration of water, all right, always. But in that scenario, all right, it will always move in the direction where there's more solutes, okay? We'll talk more about that because we're going to talk about osmotic pressure here soon. All right. Couple characteristics of blood, all right? Obviously, the first thing is color. One of the first things you notice, all right? And yes, the color, all right, the degree of oxygenation, how much oxygen is present in your blood, all right, is going to be reflected through the color of the blood. So if you have a nice red colored blood, all right, then it's pretty oxygenated, all right? If it's a darker red, all right, then it's going to be deoxygenated or oxygen poor. Does anybody know what is going on with you if your blood is cherry red? You're having some sort of poisoning going on. Does anyone know what that is? Not lead, but that's, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. What's a common uh, gas that they're worried about? Carbon monoxide poisoning. Yep, you're darn right. Carbon monoxide loves hemoglobin way more than oxygen. I'm going to tell you something. Hemoglobin loves oxygen, all right? But carbon monoxide can bind to hemoglobin way better. So if you have carbon monoxide poisoning, it's going to sit on the hemoglobin. The oxygen can't get on the hemoglobin. It gets bumped up, all right? It's like someone pushing you out of your seat, okay? That's what happens, all right? And so... The treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning, all right, is 100% oxygen right away. Because if you flood that person with oxygen, eventually it will get rid of the carbon monoxide. All right. Volume. Like I said before, about five liters in the adult, a little bit more in men than women. All right. Viscosity, that's the thickness. Okay. So your blood's going to be close to like motor oil if you ever mess around with uh, motor oil. Okay. So when we talk about viscosity it will be a little bit thicker. Now, when we talk about the, the, the term viscosity, it refers to how much of the formed substances, all right, that are in the blood, okay? So, for example, if you were to go to Mexico City or Denver, Colorado, much higher elevation, I think close to a mile, all right, oxygen at that altitude, there's a lot less of it. So your body, is going to start to make a hormone. Does anyone remember which hormone that your kidneys make to increase your red blood cell count? It was on one of the last slides I went over with you folks. I maybe had two sentences on it. That's right, EPO, erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is this hormone that your kidneys make to stimulate the production of red blood cells. So what your body starts to do is it starts to pump red blood cells into your blood. Now, it takes some time because you have to grow new red blood cells. Then they have to grow up, 
all right? We can't have the baby cells running around, all right? Then they have to mature and grow up, all right? And they get dumped into your blood. Well, if we start to do that, your blood is going to get thicker, all right? You will have a more viscous, or the viscosity will become more, all right? So we want to have a certain viscosity for our blood, okay? But if it gets too thick, it becomes like syrup, then that's a problem, okay? All right. So if we increase the viscosity, we're increasing erythrocytes, okay? If we see an increase in our viscosity, all right, because we have an increase in erythrocytes, the overall fluid will decrease too, okay, just because of that ratio between the, and we're going to talk about that. All right, plasma concentration of solids. Remember, plasma is the fluid environment for the blood, okay? So that's where you're going to have a lot of dissolved stuff, a lot of plasma proteins or, or ions. Remember, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, all that fun stuff. All right, it's going to sit in the plasma concentration. Okay? And depending on the plasma concentration of the solutes will determine which direction water is going to move. So, for example, all right, if you have a low plasma concentration of solutes in your blood and you have a high tissue uh, solutes, a high concentration of tissue, all right, let me draw a picture. That picture is better. All right, so here's a cell, all right, and it's got 10 proteins in it. Here's the capillary, and it's got one protein, okay? The blood capillary is going to have more water in it. Okay. So, in which, if you have more water in the blood and less water in the cell, which direction does the water want to move? Does it want to move from the blood into the cell or from the cell into the blood? Water. Remember, it's a passive process. So, water wants to always move down down its concentration gradient. So if there's more water, I'll say there's 100 molecules of water in the um, capillary and one here in the cell. Where does water want to go? Into the cell. It's going to leave. Okay? So we're going to say that the osmotic pressure against the capillary wall is going to facilitate water's movement out of the blood vessel. Okay? But if you look at my diagram here, all right, you have 10 molecules of solutes here and only one molecule of solute here. So can't we also say that water is going to move to the area of a higher solute concentration? Okay, I just taught this to my 210 class Thursday. Okay, so I've gotten really good at it. All right, so we're going to see that water is going to go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. In my example here, it's going to leave the blood vessel. 100 molecules of water one molecule of water in the cell. So it's going to go towards the cell. But at the same time, all right, we got 10 molecules of solute in the cell and only one in our capillary for the example. At the same time, we can say that water is going from a high water concentration to, uh, to a, an area of low water concentration, but we can also say that it's going from an area, all right, it's moving towards a higher solute concentration area. All right, that's important. We're going to come revisit that. So that's why we're talking about the example here during dehydration. Okay, so your blood plasma becomes hypertonic. Now, this is going back to chapter four, y'all. Okay, hypertonic. If you have a solution that's hypertonic, that means that that solution has more solutes in it than the cell. So the example would be. If we're talking about our blood, that would mean, all right, that if our blood plasma becomes hypertonic, that means the blood plasma has more solutes in the plasma than inside the red blood cell. Okay? And what will happen is the water inside the, the cell will leave because it wants to go to the area of higher solute concentration. So the cell will shrink up. Remember crenation, okay, chapter two, uh, chapter four, all right. Um, so in this situation, when we're talking about dehydration, our plasma is hypertonic, all right? That means it has more solutes in it. Our tissues, all right, 
will not be hypertonic. So the water from the tissues is going to go into your blood plasma. And that's going to cause those tissues to dehydrate. Okay. All right. Body temperature, talk about one degree higher. Okay. And then pH, like I said, slightly alkaline. 7.4 is the normal value. We try to keep it in here. All right. And so this is crucial. We're going to revisit this concept many, many times this semester. So make sure that you memorize that. Okay. When you put the, um, uh, the blood or whatever, any type of tissue, all right, in an acidic or an alkaline situation, more so with acidic, you will cause denaturation, denaturation of proteins. Basically, you're, you're, you're breaking down the proteins, okay? Remember, proteins do everything. They do all sorts of, they're enzymes. They make the channels for sodium and potassium to enter into your neurons, all right? Actin and myosin. Those are proteins, all right, for muscle contraction, okay? So just think, on a test, if you have no idea of what the answer is, and one of the answer choices is proteins, mark it. That's what I say, proteins do a lot. If you have no idea what the answer is, okay? Okay, questions so far at home? All right, so let's talk about blood, and when we take it out of somebody, we put it in a test tube, and then we spin that test tube up in a machine called a centrifuge, okay? So we take our whole blood that's direct from the arm, all right, and we spin it around, and it's going to separate out, all right, the blood plasma and the formed elements, okay? So on the bottom portion, so here's our test tube, okay? On the bottom portion, this part that I'm shading in, Okay, that's going to be the erythrocytes. All right, and that's going to be about 44% of your blood sample. It's a considerable amount. Okay, not quite half, but close. All right, just above that, you have this tiny thin layer. All right, and they call that the buffy coat because, again, it's got this grayish white coloring to it. All right, this is going to be the other parts of the formed elements. Remember, our white blood cells and our blood clotting agents, the platelets. So they live in here. Okay. And then you'll have on top, all right, a fluid layer. Okay. And they call it straw colored. It's going to be kind of a, a, a yellowish kind of coloration to it. All right. And that's the plasma, the liquidy part. Okay. And that's about 55%. Okay. So you want to know where these are in that centrifuged sample, all right? The blood plasma is on top, the erythrocytes are on the bottom, and in between those two layers is the buffy coat, and that's where your white blood cells are going to be, excuse me, your leukocytes and your platelets, all right? I got a picture here that I'll show you on this uh, next slide here of kind of like what it all looks like. And it's important because we're going to kind of break this down and talk about some of these items here. So you can see, we just drew blood on somebody. All right, I think probably most of us have had blood drawn. All right. And so we drew, we, drew, we drew out the blood. You can see here at the bottom layer, there's our erythrocytes. And then the buffy coat's this little uh, edge that zoom in. Whoops. And you can see, all right, here's the buffy coat right there. And then on top is our blood plasma. OK? So pretty much the makeup. All right, of these, slide over. If you notice here on the blood plasma, look at this. 92% of your blood plasma is water. Does anybody know what the overall percent of your blood is then? If you take 55% and multiply it by 92%. I did it this morning because I wasn't sure. It's 50.7. So that means 50, half of your blood is water. That's how important that is. And that's why we can use saline, all right? We can use saline, all right, as a blood volume increaser, okay? So 92% of it is water. Don't be fooled, all right? Because there are test questions that will ask you to make up, not specific exactly, but there will be some a test question or two. I can't guarantee it because it's a randomized uh, test question selection for the test. Um, 
if you'll get that question, but there is going to be one that's going to ask you the majority of the blood plasma, all right? And that's going to be water, all right? Then the remaining portion is going to be proteins. Makes sense, all right? Proteins are everywhere, and you can see, we'll talk about these, what the albumins are, the globulins, the fibrinogen, that's your clotting agent, and the regulatory proteins. Those are going to be some of the proteins that are going to help with hormone transport, all right? And then the remaining portion, all right, of our solutes are going to be electrolytes, sodium, calcium, all right? Does anyone know the definition of an electrolyte? Didn't I already ask you guys this? It's something that can conduct electricity. That's why electro, okay? And then we get nutrients. Look how small, all right? About 1% is only respiratory gases and waste products, okay? Ammonia, all right, carbon dioxide, crazy. All right, now we get into the Buffy coat. Okay, and you can see, we'll, we'll talk about the individual blood cells later on in another chapter when we do immune uh, cells, but our platelets and leukocytes, okay? And that's less than 1% of your overall blood is that Buffy coat, all right? And then finally, the big gun here, the erythrocytes, all right? They make up close to, but not quite, almost half, all right, of your overall blood, okay? So 44% of your whole blood is going to be red blood cells, as they should be. All right, do I have any questions so far? I feel like I'm flying through this stuff. If I need to slow down, let me know. I can start telling you stories, all right? That always slows me down. Um, okay, so hematocrit. Again, if you've ever had your blood drawn, all right, there are values on, the, on your, uh, your blood uh, labs, and hematocrit is one of them, okay? So if you ever looked at it, you're like, what the heck is this? Of course, you can Google it, but now I'm gonna tell you what it is, all right? All right? Your hematocrit is the actual overall volume of all those formed elements, okay? So that's gonna be, think of it, uh, the overall volume of all the cells in your blood. White blood cells, platelets, red blood cells. But here's the thing, white blood cells and platelets are so small, we really just, we just toss those out, all right? In a, clini in, in a clinical setting, okay? So they really just consider your hematocrit value the, the amount of red blood cells, okay? So if your body is producing a lot of erythropoietin, let's say, like you are going to climb Mount Everest, which by the way, is the highest mountain on the planet, all right? It is over 26,000 feet. And when you get above 20,000 feet, does anyone know what they call that, that area there? They call it the dead zone, you know why? you literally start to die. You're dying. Your body will start to undergo, all right, a series of, of changes and whatnot in which you start. Now, you won't die immediately, but you can't immediately. If you were to take somebody from sea level and plop them on top of Mount Everest, they would start to die if they don't get off there. They can't stay up there, okay, um, because of all the changes that are going on. Anyways, so when we talk about hematocrit, right, you're pumping out all that erythropoietin now. And so you're going to increase your red blood cell volume. So therefore, all right, what's going to happen to your hematocrit? Will it increase, decrease, or stay the same? What do y'all think? If I make more red blood cells, yeah, right, it goes up. Yep, it goes up. Your hematocrit will increase, right, when your red, red blood cell volume increases. So erythropoietin will increase your hematocrit levels. All right, these are just some um, clinical uh, ranges here. All right, so 42 to 56% in men, all right, and 38 uh, to 46% in women. All right, and a big contributor to that is going to be testosterone for males to stimulate erythropoietin production. All right, but also altitude, okay? If you go, uh, has anyone here ever heard of blood doping? Blood doping is basically when you take your blood, all right, I'm training or whatever, I draw off maybe a liter of blood, possibly two liters, and I refrigerate it. And then I go and train and do whatever. And then I go right before a big competition. Lance Armstrong was uh, accused of doing this. And then I take that all that blood that I just, uh, well, that I'd taken out weeks before and I put it back into my body. Yeah. And so what it does is that it increases the number of red blood cells that are floating through your body. And that's gonna increase your oxygen ca carrying capacity. All right, because say I had 1 billion uh, uh, hemoglobin molecules to carry the oxygen, now I have 1.5 billion. 
hemoglobin molecules to carry that oxygen. You, you become more effective that way it, with respiration. So that's called blood doping. That will also increase your hematocrit levels. Poor Lance Armstrong. All right, let's talk about the blood plasma now. All right, we talked about hematocrit. So let's jump into the blood plasma, which is all right, going to be our GS, which st stands for ground substance. Okay, ground substance. Okay, sometimes I have to type in there randomly just to make sure that the thing doesn't crash on me. It's been, I've been having a horrible luck here on campus with uh, Google, uh, and so it keeps crashing on me. All right, so you look at the values up there on the screen and on your screen at home, all right, water is going to be the majority, all right, of your blood plasma. Okay, it is the ground substance, so therefore we refer to it as the extracellular fluid. Okay, because we're still dealing with connective tissue here. All right, so a fact that you should be interested in is that the blood plasma is similar, but not the same, but similar to our interstitial fluid. You know what interstitial fluid is? I'll give you an easy definition for it. It is the fluid outside of our cells. Bam, easy, okay? So when we're talking about, all right, skin tissue, for example, all right, let's say the papillary layer or the reticular layer of your dermis, okay, you have cells that live in those layers, all right, the interstitial fluid is all that fluid, all right, in those layers outside of the cells, okay? The important thing, you need to know this, okay, this guy right here, all right, blood plasma has a higher concentration of protein. That's important. I want you to think just for right now as protein as a magnet for water. Okay, didn't we just say with osmosis that water is going to move to an area of higher solute concentration? Our proteins are part of those solutes. Okay, so our blood plasma has a higher solute concentration or a higher, like it says here on the screen, protein concentration. So that means that water is going to want to move from the tissues into our blood vessels. Okay, <clears throat> but we're going to talk about why and what influences that movement of water. Okay, but because of that high protein concentration, all right, water is going to want to be drawn into the blood vessel. All right, questions so far? Okay. All right, that word looks familiar. Colloid, does anyone remember me talking about colloid in chapter 17? Remember when we were talking about glandular epithelium and the thyroid, okay? And at the center of those thyroid follicles, we had colloid there with the thyroglobulin and all that. Remember that? Okay. So this is what we're talking about. So blood literally is another colloid. It's all right. So that means, all right, it does have a plasma. Obviously, we know that. But in that plasma, we have proteins scattered throughout it. So that, by definition, means that blood is a colloid, all right, protein rich. So keep it in mind, like what I said about proteins, think of them as a magnet for water, okay? So it's important that we know that. So we're going to talk about now all these different types of proteins that are found in our blood. This one here is huge, albumin, and I guarantee you, if it's, anyone here ever had to do a, a liver a enzyme panel before? I have several times, all right? And this is a very important uh, protein because this protein, if you're low, if you're low on uh, the albumin, okay, you're gonna get tissue swelling. I'll get into that, I'll get into that. But keep in mind, these proteins, and this is another reason why your liver is so important, okay? It has so many different functions, all right? But it's gonna produce many of these proteins, a lot of them, in fact, okay? So if you look here, all right, when we're talking about all the different types of plasma proteins, albumin, globulins, that will include some of your antibodies, all right, fibrinogen, which helps with clotting, all right, 
many other clotting proteins, enzymes. I like a good enzyme. Enzymes help with all right chemical reactions. Okay, remember, think of an enzyme as a lighter to start a fire. Okay, that's what's going to happen here. And then obviously our hormones. Okay, that's going to be all found here in our plasma proteins. Okay. So not all, like I said, not all of these proteins will be made by the liver. Some of our white blood cells are going to make, for a perfect example, the plasma cell. All right, briefly talked about it, all right, back in 210, all right, but a plasma cell started off as a B lymphocyte, and then it transforms into a plasma cell, and it makes antibodies. And I'm sure you folks have been hearing a lot about antibodies, especially when they're talking about COVID, all right? That, you, your COVID antibodies don't last very long, or your COVID antibodies, all right, you can go and sell them or whatever, all right? So the, the plasma cell is what makes, all right, those, um, those plasma proteins, those antibodies there. Okay, so like I was saying, all right, think of plasma proteins as a magnet for water, and this is a huge concept here, all right? These proteins are going to exert what we call colloid osmotic pressure. So when you hear colloid, think of pro plasma proteins or protein. Osmotic water. Okay, let's break this down and make it simple so you know what you're reading here. Colloid osmotic pressure. Basically what that's saying is it's the pressure of water as it's moving, all right, in and out of blood vessels and it's being moved due to the presence of proteins, plasma proteins specifically. Okay, so this is what happens. These plasma proteins circulate throughout your bloodstream. And like I said, all right, they're a magnet to water. So they're going to want to draw water from, all right, the tissues into your blood. Or you could say they're going to help to prevent the loss of fluid from the blood. They're going to keep a lot of that fluid, all right, because remember our capillaries is where we're going to see the exchange of nutrients and wastes between the blood and the tissues there, okay? So during that exchange process, we don't want to lose fluid because if we start leaking fluid out of our capillaries, our blood pressure is going to drop. That's bad because guess what's going to happen? If your blood pressure starts to drop, your heart's going to beat faster. It's a, re it's a reflex. Well, that means you're going to start pumping out more blood which means if you have leaky blood vessels, you're gonna leak more. That's not good, okay? So we wanna prevent that. So these plasma proteins prevent that from happening. They'll hold that fluid, all right, into the blood vessels of the capillaries during that exchange process. It's kind of nice, all right? We just, that helps to maintain our blood pressure. Oh, yeah, can't talk. Our blood pressure. So that's why I talk about it helps to maintain blood volume because we're not leaking the, the fluid out of your uh, capillaries and it helps to maintain blood pressure. Important that you know that, okay? So certain diseases can cause problems to your plasma proteins. For example, liver disease. If you damage the organ that makes these plasma proteins, you're gonna produce less plasma proteins, which means you're going to decrease your colloid osmotic pressure and those blood vessels will be leaky. You'll get what's called edema, all right? and you'll get big swelling, especially in the lower extremities, okay? So these liver diseases will decrease that, the, the making of those plasma proteins, all right? And then you will lose that the, the fluid because it won't be drawn to the plasma proteins. Kidney disease, okay? If, you're, if you get kidney disease, perfect example, uh, um, that's what I wanna use here, non-compliant, uh, uh, diabetics, especially type one, they don't take care of themselves very well, they will eventually destroy their kidneys. And when that happens, they usually are going on kidney dialysis. And at that point, when you're on kidney dialysis, your kidneys, their job is to filter the blood, essentially. Let's just, I mean, we'll learn many more other things they're gonna do, but their job is to filter the blood, filter it out. Well, if you damage that filtering system, you're gonna lose a lot of stuff from your blood that you didn't wanna lose, all right? And again, these plasma proteins are one of those. So your kidneys, you do a, a urine dipstick on these patients, and you'll look on there. Has anyone ever done a, a urine dipstick test on yourself? Or you can buy them in the store just to see, you know, if you've got sugar in your urine. 
but one of the things on there are white blood cells. Another thing is protein, blood, whatever. If you look at that, they'll have their proteins in their urine will be, will be skyrocketing, right? And so they'll have a list of other issues going on. All right, so let's talk about the first one, the albumins. Okay, they are the most abundant group of plasma proteins. Look at that, 58%. All right, so that means these guys are going to influence your colloid osmotic pressure the most. So if someone comes into your whatever, your practice office, if you're going into medicine or whatever, and they've got uh, their extremities are all swollen, especially around their shins and ankles. Like, I don't know what's going on. All right. So what you're going to see is, and you say, I'm going to order a blood uh, a panel on you, and the albumin come down back. All right, virtually non-existent. Two things, you know, where the swelling is coming from because their, 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 plasma, their plasma protein level of albumin is low, and then they probably have liver disease, okay? So keep in mind also, all right, they do affect the osmotic pressure, but they will also be used to help transport, all right, lipids, some of our fats, hormones, because some of the hormones need a last chapter you heard me talk about carrier proteins that's what the albumins will act as they will be a carrier protein and ions what's an ion anybody know ion don't make me sad i'm going to start to cry an ion is a charged particle okay like sodium n plus potassium k plus uh calcium okay those are ions. It's a charge. You can have an anion, which is a negatively charged particle or, or atom, and then a, a cation, which is a positively charged um, element or ion or atom. I mean. All right. The next one, the globulins. All right. Now we have the alpha globulins and the beta globulins. All right. And again, they all also are crucial because they help to transport what we call water insoluble molecules. If they're water soluble, that means they're just going to dissolve in the blood plasma, and that's fine. All right, but some can't. Okay? So these type, the alpha globulins and the beta globulins are going to pick up those water insoluble molecules and help transport them. Also, hormones, because remember what I said, all right? If a hormone is not bound to, um, a, a transport protein or, or transport ca or pr carrier protein, it will start to degrade, all right, and break down, which is fine if we, whatever that hormone is for, all right, whatever type of uh, response, we don't need it anymore. That's fine, all right? But if we need it for a specific response like growth hormone or whatnot, we need to keep circulating or eventually get into a desired cell, all right? So in order to prolong its half-life, we um, stick it onto one of those transport proteins there, all right? Metals, ions, we already know what that is. And then our gamma, our gamma globulins, these are the guys I was talking about, the immunoglobulins or the antibodies, okay? And they're gonna help with defense, okay? <clears throat> okay, any questions about that? there's a lot more detail, but I'll save it for you guys, okay? So this is, I just want you to know the basics on this, okay? And who knows, now the next time you go and get your blood drawn, you actually can look at the report and you're like, I, I know what that does. I know what that is. That's cool. All right, fibrinogen, right? Think of blood clots, okay? Blood clots. You need this, okay? Blood clotting is, is um, that whole process is, is based on what we call an enzymatic cascade, which means there's a series of steps to eventually get to the clotting of blood, which means we're going to need a bunch of enzymes, all right, and a bunch of what we call intermediates, all right? But we're going to start off with fibrinogen, and then it'll undergo, all right, some sort of enzymatic cascade, and it will wind up with what we call fibrin, okay? And fibrin are these strands, all right, it's like a net, okay? It's this net that you use, and it catches platelets, all right? And it catches red blood cells, and it stops the clotting, okay? And you need to know that it's insoluble, 
because you have a specific type of protein that then breaks it down when it's time to get rid of the blood clot. Okay? So if you ever heard of the term serum, what we did is we took all the clotting proteins away. So if I draw blood out of your, out of your uh, arm, it's going to start to clot. Okay? So we either have to remove the blood clotting protein or we have to put in a specific type of anti-clotting agent. Uh, I want to make sure I get the letters right. I think it's EDTA, which is when you go get your blood drawn. I think that's the purple tube or the blue tube. I think it's the blue tube. If you ever notice, if you ever had blood taken from you, they take a couple vials out. All right, one they'll just take the whole blood. All right, and then. If you look at the tube, there's different color tubes, and they represent, I believe it's the blue one. If anyone knows at home, throw it out there at me. I think it's the blue one that has the, the, um, the blood thinner, the anti-clotting agent added to it, so your blood doesn't clot once it leaves the body. All right, and then finally, for our plasma proteins, we have our regular regulatory proteins, all right? And that's going to be the enzymes and the hormones. Easy. So we call those regulatory proteins because that's what hormones do. They're going to regulate some sort of response. <clears throat> All right. Any questions on that so far? Not so far? Okay. Okay. So, my seventh grader son, which makes me very proud because he had a science test today. And he got a hundred on it, and he's there, he's learning the same stuff that I'm teaching you guys. So I get mad at him because he doesn't want to talk to me about the stuff that he's learning. I tried to get both my kids. I have a seventh grade son; he's thirteen. My daughter's in fifth grade, and I told I don't know how we got on the, the topic of poop, but I asked them. I said, "Do you guys want to know what gives poop its color?" And that made them very uncomfortable. Anyways, so he and and she through school, which makes me happy. Learned, especially my daughter just recently learned what a solution is. Okay. And so blood is a solution. All right. So what is that? All right. Solution is a liquidy substance. All right. So you kept hearing me talk about, well, not all of you. Some of you heard me talk about um, when we did chapter two, talking about acids and bases, and you add an acid to a solution. And then what will happen is the hydrogen ion will dissociate and come off. All right, so blood is going to be our solution for this example. All right, it's going to be a liquidy environment that's going to have organic and inorganic molecules, and we just sprinkle in some ions in there, okay? So organic molecules are going to be any type of molecule that contain carbon, okay? That's the chemical definition of organic molecule. It has to have, in its molecular formula, carbon in it. If it doesn't, then it's considered to be inorganic got into an argument with a math teacher on it. He didn't believe me. So we Googled it and I was right. <clears throat> Sometimes I like to be right. Okay. And then also we are going to include our electrolytes. Okay. Sodium, potassium, all those fun ones. All right. Nutrients. Okay. Our respiratory gases. And of course, if you have nutrients, all right, when the cell metabolizes those nutrients, it's going to make waste. Okay. So the, the nice characteristic that you really want to know about blood is that polar and charged substances can dissolve easily, which is good. They dissolve into the solution, and then we can transport them nice and easily to whatever their destination is going to be. Okay? What are the two characteristics for something to move across a plasma membrane without any help? You guys remember? I just got done teaching this too. Small and uncharged, right? Or nonpolar. Yeah. So they, they can move right through the phospholipid bilayer. They're really small. Okay. They can shoot right through if they're obviously really small, which makes sense. All right. And if they are nonpolar, that means they will not react. Okay. So, all right, these substances here cannot move through a plasma membrane, all right, unless they have help, which is good and sometimes bad, depending on it, all right? But nonpolar molecules, all right, these are the ones, if they're small, that can move through a plasma membrane. 
Here's the issue, all right? They need carrier proteins in our circulation. Because if, if think about it, if it's nonpolar and small, what's to stop it from diffusing right directly across the simple squamous endothelium there, okay? Nothing. We wouldn't want that because we need that stuff to make its way through our circulation, all right? It needs to travel around. Okay. Ooh, hemopoiesis, often talked about in 210, but never really quite explained. So now we get to dis explain it a little bit, because we're going to start talking about, um, hmm. you know what, give me one second here. I want to see something. All right, I will start this, but I won't get too far into it. All right, let's just go over some of the basic stuff. I don't want to overwhelm you too much. I'm telling you, this is uh, um, this semester. And by the way, I've, I've told the other section this, and I'm sure if you, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it when I was recording. Um, my, my goal is one to make the flow of this course as fluid and as easy as possible. Obviously, it helps to facilitate the learning process for you folks. All right, um, and I have that opportunity because now I don't have to give tests in class, so I can use that to teach more the material, but space it out. And that's my goal is to make sure that we I space it out, but you're not too overwhelmed. You're going to see there's going to be a difference between the, the flow of material in 210 versus 211. I'm hoping it's going to feel like it's less because 210 can be very overwhelming, especially the lab portion. You're going to find out it won't be as overwhelming here. All right, so let's talk about this process of hemopoiesis. All right, this is how we make all those formed elements of the blood. And remember, what did we say the formed elements were? The cells, all those different cells that we talked about, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So now we're going to talk about it. All right, we learned last semester, excuse me, we learned in 210 that this occurs in red bone marrow. Remember, there's two types of bone marrow, red and yellow, okay? Red is, think of it as the active form, and yellow is inactive. Okay, so it kind of gets that yellowing appearance because it starts to take on more of an adipose or lipid uh, composition, more fat. Okay, but the nice thing is, so think of it as inactive, but the nice thing is you can reactivate yellow bone marrow back into red bone marrow. Okay, so we're going to start off with our stem cells here. Okay, and those are called hemocytoblasts. Does anyone know what this term here? Oh, well, said the right thing. I hate when I do that, all right? Pluripotent is a very important term that you need to understand because these types, it's a great characteristic. I wish I was pluripotent, all right? Which means that I could change into whatever I wanted, all right? So in this situation, our pluripotent cells, they can differentiate, all right, into many types of cells, okay? Depending on what your body needs, okay? So these hemocytoblasts, or hemo, yeah, hemocytoblasts, all right? They can turn into, these are the stem cells, they can turn into almost any cell type. It's usually dependent on the needs of the body though, all right? So I, you need to understand this. There are two different cell lines, okay? Myeloid and lymphoid. So you've heard of lymphoblastic leukemia, all right? That's based on that type of cell line all right, that that cancer affects, okay? So, all right, keep in mind, you have two types, the myeloid line and the lymphoid line. I'll show you a, a slide here, probably not today, that will kind of explain it. All right, so what's the myeloid line, all right? Red blood cells, all of the white blood cells except the lymphocytes, and that's why we call them lymphocytes because they come from the lymphoid line. And then finally, we've got these cool cells, the megacarrier sites. They're like a, a, a mega version of, of platelets, all right? And they're going to almost like pop. And inside it, you'll have all these little tiny platelets. Platelets are really small, okay? So you want to know the difference with all, or, or which cells come from where, all right? So the myeloid line are red blood cells, the erythrocytes, all right, are leukocytes, all right, except for the lymphocytes, and then the megacarrier sites which are going to be the ultimate cell that make platelets, All right? So lymphocytes are also white blood cells. 
All right, and then of course, we need some sort of chemical that is going to um, facilitate or encourage these cells to transform into a specific cell line. So we have what, call, what we call CSFs, or colony stimulating factors. Okay, these chemicals are going to drive this process. There's a couple different types. I'm not going to go into those right now. Okay, so hemopoiesis, the production of formed elements of the blood, all the cells there. Okay, all righty. All right, so let's start off with erythropoiesis. Okay, how do we make red blood cells? Well, first of all, we need ingredients. We need iron. What do we need the iron for? What is the most common form of anemia? Anyone here? Uh, uh, well, don't tell me. <laughs> Does anybody here know of somebody that has been um, uh, diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia? All right, well, it's the most common type. And basically, you need iron, all right, for your, your um, hemoglobin. Wow, that took a second. Um, you need iron for hemoglobin, right? Because that's what allows oxygen to bind onto that protein, right? So we need iron to make a proper hemoglobin. Our vitamin B vitamins, especially all right, B12. And guess who doesn't have a lot of B12? Anybody? No, vegans, vegetarians. Yep, they're prone to it because a rich source of B12 is meat, red meat especially. So uh, I have several patients that are uh, um, B12 deficient, and they can either take a supplement or start eating meat, but if they're a vegan, they're not going to eat the meat, all right? But B12 is important for that, okay? And then amino acids. What are amino acids? What do amino acids make? Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Building block, okay? So these are the ingredients, much like a carpenter, if you're gonna have your de a deck built to your house, needs wood, nails, and all that, all right, your red blood cell, uh, your red bone marrow needs iron, B vitamins, amino acids to make these cells, okay? All right, so we start off, and I'll walk you through, this is the picture I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you right back to the slide, all right? But this is what we're gonna start off here with. All right, you can see here for is a, a erythropoiesis. But again, I, I will not expect you to be able to tell me the name of all these cells at each stage, okay? I, it just won't happen. All right, but what you're going to see here is that the red blood cell has to go through a series of stages, okay? Just in, the, in its processing here, okay? So we start off with, you can see up here, let's see that too well. all right, here's our co colony stimulating factor, okay? You can see there's different types, but as we move through, EPO stands for erythropoietin. So here's that hormone that you need to help facilitate this process here, all right? The actual making here of our red blood cell, okay? Let me jump back now. Was I here? Nope, I was not there either. There we go. Bam. Okay. So we're going to start off with our stem cell, the myeloid cell. All right. Our con and then we're going to start blasting it with that all right, colony stimulating factor that is going to then promote its differentiation into all right, our progenerator cell that's specific for the erythrocyte line. Okay. And again, I'll let you write this down. I'm not going to go through all this, but I want you to understand something. When we're at this guy right here, the proerythroblast, we have a nucleus, okay? But as we start to go down, we get to the normal blast. Guess what? We lose the nucleus. Red blood cell is one of the few blood, few excuse me, the few cells in your body that does not have a nucleus, all right? It's, and so it's not going to be living very long, all right? Because what's, what's the nucleus? What is that to a cell? 
What's inside the nucleus? DNA. Yeah, DNA. The nucleus is the control center for your cell. It's got your blueprint. All right, what makes you you? What makes your hair dark or thick? What makes someone tall or short? All right, what makes your eyes brown or, or green or whatever? Okay, so all of that lives inside the nucleus there. Okay, so we're seeing here at some point through the development of the red blood cell that we lose our nucleus. But guess what? We got some hemoglobin, and that's good because we're, we're game there. Now, at this point, when we get to the reticulocyte, Okay, that's like a baby version of the red blood cell. Okay, we still don't have the organelles, right, but we do have ribosomes. So what's a ribosome? All this is fresh in my mind because I just taught it to my two time class last week. Ribosomes make proteins. Okay, they make the proteins. All right, so they're going to make hemoglobin. Okay, and then, all right, at one point, when it's a mature red blood cell, an erythrocyte, we no longer have those ribosomes. We're not going to make any more hemoglobin. So you're stuck with what you've made. Okay? You're stuck with what you made. All right. I'm going to stop here, guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, people. Um, let's stop. Uh, I know I'm stopping a couple minutes early. Again, we've got plenty of time to do this. Let's take about 10, 15 minute break. Okay. Every, 